It's good to see so many young faces here. Um, welcome, uh, welcome, dear students, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We are happy to get you joined us today here in the main hall of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, and I would also like to welcome those who watch us on live stream. A few of our students are still on their way. You may know that it's difficult sometimes to get to Austria because of visa issues and travel issues. Let me especially welcome Alma Sadic, the Austrian Federal Minister for Justice. We are proud that you will address our students. For me, it's a, it's a pleasure as director of this institution and a graduate of the Academy to welcome you, you all here at the Vienna School of International Studies, Ecole des Hautitudes Internationales de Vienne. Um, I would also like to greet all our partners uh, who are with us from the Austrian Ministry of European and Foreign Affairs, but also our members of the Board of Trustees and the Associates for the Advancement of Teaching here. All the embassies represented uh, from, from the countries where our student comes and the international organization uh, who join us in supporting the work of us all and for, especially for your students. Um, and I would also like to, uh, to thank our sponsors because without them it wouldn't be possible uh, to do the work that, that we are doing. Uh, and the, it was always our philosophy from the beginning to give support to the best students irrespective of the possibilities they have. So you are those, we think, who are gifted and not you who have, who have the money to be here. Uh, about 40% of our students receive financial support. Therefore, I would like to thank all those public and private institutions and individuals, and I'm glad to see one of them is with us. So special welcome to Herbert Kort, alumnus of the Diplomatic Academy. <laughs> Herbert Kort is supporting two plus two students, so it's really someone who is valuable to us. Uh, we also thank our other partners, the international organizations in Vienna, the city of Vienna, uh, and the board of trustees. Uh, I think one can say Vienna is the perfect place uh, for such an institution because of all those institutions here present in Vienna. We are the seat of one of the UN seats, the only one in the European Union. And just recently, uh, a friend of the Academy, Angus Robertson, who is the Foreign and Cultural Secretary of the Scottish government, Scottish government wrote a book about Vienna as being the diplomatic capital of the world. You might imagine that we immediately bought a few copies to get it around, to, to get the news around. Um, with, the, with these thanks, I would also include certainly our faculty. So welcome to our faculty. They are all here, with one exception, who has the flu. It's not corona, but the flu. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the work that you will do with, with our students. Uh, and especially, I want to welcome our new deputy director, Martina Schubert. She has held many high-level functions in Brussels, last as deputy chief uh, of head of mission of Austria to NATO, uh, and has a profound knowledge on European affairs. We are happy that you joined our team. Welcome, Martina. <laughs> you will have a, a lot of contact with Martina, I can, I can assure you. Uh, I'm happy to see also here so many faces I already know. Uh, and uh, we are starting the academic year in a hopeful mood. I, last year, I was not so sure whether it's possible to see everyone in person. This year, it looks very likely that we are in a better situation. Um, and this is something that uh, I can tell from the experience of the last two and a half years, three years, how difficult it is uh, to follow only on Zoom, whether one is really there or not there, uh, and especially our faculty, I think, is thankful that they have uh, the possibility not to sit in Zoom meetings all the time. The student community here consists at the moment of 170 uh, students in our four programs, uh, and you come from 45 countries uh, from all continents. 
And I'm, I'm really proud to say for the first time we have also students from Afghanistan and from Vietnam. Uh, so there are not many countries left where we never had students from. Uh, and uh, um, roughly one third of you are Austrians and two thirds are coming from abroad. Uh, and you have a very diverse academic background. This is always something that we look for when we, when we uh, uh, skim the, the applications. Uh, you are not only from political science, although there is a majority from political science, but uh, there are also from economics, law, languages, history, medicine, music, anthropology, natural sciences, theater, film, and media. And I hope this is right, what my assistants wrote me down uh, in, in, in my paper. Uh, so there is a diverse cultural background. You might imagine it's a diverse cultural background. Uh, and uh, I would also like to say, and I'm doing it, that our student body is overwhelmingly female. This year, almost 60% of our students are women. Uh, the diversity I mentioned is our added value. This is something that, this is something that, that we really want to say, that uh, having people from different regions, you have to respect each other. Sometimes it may not be that easy because we will have a close contact with each other, and that's good. Actually, we even have marriages after our, our school that I, I'm told uh, on quite a regular basis, Madam Minister. Um, but use this real opportunity to learn from each other. In this regard, I think our keynote speaker is a perfect example. Alma Sadic is Austrian Minister of Justice. She was born in Tuzla in Bosnia-Herzegovina and came to Vienna as a refugee. Uh, she studied law in Vienna, but not only in Vienna, but also in Milan and Columbia University in New York. Uh, and before working as a lawyer, she worked for the International Organization for Migration and for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, so she is, was in the midst of almost everything that we are talking about nowadays. But she always says she doesn't want to be defined by her migration background, uh, and that these international experiences showed her that you can be Austrian, Bosnian, and European at the same time. That is actually something, I may say this is an Austrian, what I think makes Austrian identity special. Uh, and we hope that politically we can keep this up and uh, maybe even get more integration su successes. Uh, we are happy to welcome more than 18 new students to our campus. Uh, this is amazing given the difficult circumstances we find ourselves uh, in. We really appreciate the efforts you made, efforts, practical efforts and intellectual efforts uh, to be with us, uh, and that you will enjoy the, your academic year or years at the DA. Uh, I would also like to welcome our exchange students. I don't know where they are sitting at the moment, but we have four visiting students from Denver University Corbell School and while two of our students are at Stanford, uh, we have uh, two exchange students from Stanford. They are here right now. Welcome to them, wherever they are. <laughs> um, in our PhD program, which we are also proud of, uh, we have with the University uh, uh, of, of Vienna num the number of nine students at the moment, uh, and the first one in the history of the Diplomatic Academy graduated this summer. Uh, so you see, although we have a long history, we date back to 1754, uh, we have still have something new to begin, like the first of our doctors from the, from the Diplomatic Academy. This is because we work closely with the University of, of Vienna. Actually, in the future, I would love to say that we as a diplomatic academy might graduate doctorates and others directly uh, without having to, to, to work with a university. But this is a plan for the future and depends on many different things. As much as diplomacy and international uh, professions have changed over the centuries, so has the diplomatic academy. Uh, however, some things remain the same, and these are the things I would like to mention here, the commitment to academic excellence and the principles of, of interdisciplinarity. You will hear this a lot in these one or two years, uh, and to the principles also of fundamental values of openness and the liberal world order. 
Uh, we are not in an ivory tower. Some of our universities have problems with this, uh, but this school always, always feels that it has to have also a practical purpose for the future of, of not only your careers, but for the future of what's happening uh, around us. And it's, with my team, it's, it's my task to position this academy not only as a leading postgraduate center of excellence for you, but we also want to help you to shape economics and politics of this ever globalizing world. And I believe it's still an ever globalizing world, whatever the restraints are that we are living through. Uh, but I have to say, we will try to prepare you in the best possible way for something that in truth we can only develop together, the future of our society and our world. I would never have thought that I would have to open a new academic year in times of war. Uh, we have to defend our democracy and democratic world against the aggression of Russia at the moment. Uh, and let me just say the, the sentence of Thomas Hobbes, hell is truth seen too late. Hell is truth seen too late. And maybe this was something that uh, we did uh, in the last few years. And there is actually only one advice I would want to give you. Be courageous. Be courageous, which is normally not a quality of diplomats you would expect at the, at the very beginning. But courage and character, are, even if they are not the image of a diplomat or someone working for an international organization, uh, it is not something about being a hero, but there are a number of examples in history where it was decisive that people showed courage. And that's something that I hope that you will remember. Uh, some of you may remember our last year's inauguration speaker, our alumnus Valentin Insko, and he gave some advice on what young diplomats should do. And he gave it from his practical experience in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he also talked about lessons learned from his career Speaking truthful, speaking truthful was already something. Even if it is an inconvenient message, speaking out, follow your conscience, dare to do what you feel is the right thing. Uh, and you may remember that one of the last things he did was something which was quite courageous uh, in his position in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This is a wendet set, this is a turning point in history. But I know that compared to other places, Austria looks quite an island of the blessed still, but it's not true. Turmoil and crisis are coming already very close. We are lucky to live here in peace, but nevertheless, we are affected and we have to care. And that's the most important thing. Uh, it is undeniable that uh, the disruptions around that, it is making us more difficult to see the common good. But diplomacy is all about the common good. Even Kissinger said, it's not only about national interests, but it's also about the common good. And if, if a real political like Kissinger says that, please follow his advice. Uh, I don't believe that diplomacy failed in the last few months. That's what I heard. I was asked very often in public, did diplomacy fail in Afghanistan a year ago? Did diplomacy fail in the Ukraine-Russian war? And I always said, no, it's not diplomacy. But diplomacy continues. But what fail is the will of those who are decisive in their countries to follow what diplomacy recommended to them. Uh, so don't despair about diplomacy, even if it, if it looks in a different way. Uh, and when we look at our alumni, the career paths of our alumni, I can tell you that most of them have their ideals still. They're not working from nine to five. They are working in all sorts of fields where they want to change everything. But you, I think you have to trust in yourself and your abilities to change things. That's why we, here we also try to equip you not only with these academic courses, uh, we have, but with all the skills and the competences that might be helpful to you. Uh, and also extracurricular activities I'm not going to mention all of them here, but you should use all the extracurricular activities that uh, mainly use your own student initiative, DASI, uh, will prepare for you, and you will later hear a few words uh, from them. But welcome to the DASI. Where are they? Yeah, welcome to the DASI already now. Hello. <laughs> Thank you.
you will organize conferences, you will write for your students' magazine polemics, you will organize um, a Viennese ball in these rooms here. Uh, so please go ahead. Uh, we try to control as little as possible uh, in all these activities that you follow, uh, and I hope that you will uh, have fun in all this. Uh, we will offer you study trips, uh, and it's good that they are back. The 12 day long trip, uh, trip by bus for, this, for the MAIS 2 people to the Balkans, but also to Brussels, Israel, Kurdistan, and let's see what still comes around the corner. These study trips have always belonged to the highlights of the academic year. Uh, and you will have career services, very important also. You will meet the people from, uh, from international companies, from international organizations. There will be a speed dating actually in, in this hall uh, in spring. Please use the, these opportunities and also work with the Club DA, our alumnus, alumni organization, and take advantage uh, of this network. Uh, they stay closely linked to the alma mater and help you prepare for your international career. Uh, what I finally would like to say, and, and, and I say this every year, you are now part of a community. And hopefully you are learning a lot about emotional intelligence, intercultural competences, and you know all these, these words. But you are a truly international family with an atmosphere of plurilingual, plurilingualism on our campus. Uh, and uh, you know, as many times you want to be a better human being, learning a language is not a bad thing, actually. And that's, that's why my special greetings go to our dedicated language department heads. Welcome. <laughs> Please also make use of the, of, the, of the networking possibilities of our public events. You can meet heads of state, foreign ministers, scholars from all over the world at many public events here at the DA. Uh, as it is a leading venue for international conferences. Last week, the Austrian Chancellor came here uh, and talked about, quite candidly, about foreign policy, Austrian foreign policy. Uh, he did not say much about foreign policy in public, but he said it here to members of the Club DA, exclus exclusively, actually. Uh, and yesterday, the EU Special Representative for the Middle East process was talking about how difficult his job is, uh, and tomorrow we will have um, someone from the Foreign Ministry of Finland who will talk why Finland uh, and how Finland choose to NATO membership. So please take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, and we also have, and you can meet them in our corridors, regular executive programs with civil servants from around, uh, from around the globe uh, and use their experience when you see them somewhere here on the campus. Uh, we have been doing this for more than 30 years uh, and that's very good, and it's an extra for this. But in the center of all are you, the dedicated and talented students, and passionate, hopefully, students that we have with us. Uh, and uh, we look forward for, to a dynamic and diverse uh, work here with you. We promise you to continue our work with enthusiasm, energy, and certainly the belief in the importance of excellence training. And I'm sure that I have not to mention to have fun. That's also an important part uh, of all of this. The minister nods. You see. <laughs> I wish you all a very interesting, rewarding, productive, and enjoyable next academic year. Uh, and uh, let me finish by telling you the story that I experienced in Buckingham Palace when I had my farewell reception with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth end of 2014, it was snowing outside, uh, and I made a mistake, a terrible mistake as a diplomat. I, I uh, told the Queen that I'm looking forward to going to Moscow. I'm looking forward to going to Moscow. Prince Philip looked at my wife, she was with me, and said here, don't forget to wear warm underwear, <laughs> my dear. <laughs> and every, actually, that's, I think that tells you a lot about how difficult things may be if you are working in the international field. So on behalf of my faculty, the entire staff and our many partners, I hope that we will all have a successful and joyful year. Welcome.
Your Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear students. It's an honor for me to speak before you today. And it's an honor to speak this keynote speech because it's a very special day for you. And I also have to admit it's a very special for day for me because, because it's my first keynote speak before the Diplomatische Akademie and that it's one of the older, it's the oldest school of its kind. And that's why this is a special moment for me and it's a special moment for you as well. And I'm absolutely thrilled because it's also one of the rare moments where we come as such a big group together and it's a pleasure to speak to you in person. Video conferences have had their advantages, but nothing beats real encounter. And this also means, this is this especially true for diplomatic relations. Meeting the people in person is necessary in diplomatic relations. And it is necessary because if you want to change things, if you want to change how the direction in which we are heading, we need diplomacy, we need trust, we need integrity, and all of that you cannot do through video conferencing. You have to do that in person. And this is an exciting moment because it's a new chapter that is starting for you today. It's a new chapter full of experiences, friendships, and memories. And of course, this being a school after all, not everything will be easy and fun, but it will require focus and patience and a clear desire to move forward and to change things, a clear desire to work together. In other words, it will require resilience. And given the world we find ourselves in today, these skills, and in particular the skill of resilience, will become even more essential. Of course, uncertainty this is what the future is all about. We simply do not know what the future holds for us. We can only predict, believe, but also envision. And still, this kind of future thinking is a whole core human cognitive feature, essential for our way of being and navigating through life. However, or unfortunately, the current mood seems rather pessimistic. The current epochal contingencies have the potential to constrain the societal and individual capacity of future thinking. It's hard to envision a better future, in particular if you look at our reality today. In his opening remarks of the 77th session of the UN General Assembly just this September, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, and I quote, our world is in big trouble. Divides are growing deeper. Inequalities are growing wider. Challenges are spreading farther. A winter of global discontent is on the horizon. A cost of living crisis is raging. Trust is crumbling. Inequalities are exploding and our planet is burning, end of quote. It is clear, these are serious and troubling times of multiple crises feeding on each other. And potentially more than ever, the world feels out of joint. Russia's and Putin's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine threw an already unpredictable world in a deeper uncertainty. The invasion brought full-scale human loss and suffering back to Europe. Suddenly, those pictures that we see on television are, are our daily reality. The war has accelerated geopolitical shifts with the potential of undermining our global peace, our global world order based on multilateralism, the rule of international law, and human rights. For Europe, this is also a question of the power of, the, of democracy. President von der Leyen has repeatedly stressed 
of how to uphold fundamental principles which are increasingly being cha challenged, not only from outside, but also from within. Thus, we are at a point in history where it feels as if, and I quote, yet again, one epoch came to an end, and yet again, a new epoch began. And I'm, queening, I'm, I'm quoting a keen observer of humanity, the Austrian writer Stefan Zweig, in The World of Yesterday, which he explains and recounts his experiences of 1939. And of course, I do not need to tell you all of those things and all of those challenging things because you wouldn't be pursuing this career if you were not well informed about what's going on. And I'm sure you are observing all these developments very closely. And it's amazing and very courageous of you that you are still choosing this, this path of international diplomacy. And let me assure you, you have made a courageous and very important decision. The cu current situation is difficult, it's serious, but it's not hopeless because it needs people like you, people who trust in the future, people who are courageous, who want to change the future. Also, Secretary General Guterres has said, we have a duty to act. And that he made clear in his opening remarks. We need a coalition of the world. And this is why we need you. More than ever, we need experts to facilitate and foster dialogue, cooperation, and specific settlements of disputes. More than ever, we need to put international law, especially human rights and humanitarian law, at the center of international relations, of our politics. More than ever, we need to restore the public trust in democracy and the rule of law so that we as a society and international community become more resilient against illiberal and destabilizing factors. More than ever, we need to find common responses to socioeconomic inequalities and to turn around this current course steering head on towards climate catastrophe. And more than ever, we need to envision a better future. We need strategic future thinking. And more than ever, we will need to act together. And of course, speaking of joint action and international solidarity, I want to bring three examples that I, as a Minister of Justice, have encountered in my career so far, but also in the challenges that we are facing as politicians, as those in decision-making positions. First of all, democracy. It's safe to say that Ministers of Justice usually are not the key players of international affairs. But if you look at our, what's happening in the world right now, if you look at, look at the European Union, if you look at the forces and that are acting now within the European Union, that are endangering our democracies, the ministers of justice in their nation states are relevant gatekeepers for democracy. They are relevant gatekeepers for international law and the judiciary. And I consider international rule of law the rule of all the national rule of law and the judiciary an important gatekeeper for our democracy. And our democracy is being threatened because also a lot of people are losing the trust into democracy. And why are they losing the trust? And this might not always have to do with international relations, but it has very much to do also with national politics. People are losing trust into democracy because of corruption. We gave all of us believe in democracy because it gives us one promise. It gives us the promise that everyone has the right to vote. Everyone, one woman, one man, one vote. So everyone has the equal rights to change things because they can vote and change a certain perspective, change the, the direction where everything is heading. And 
corruption is undermining this very promise. It's undermining this very promise because it gives us the impression that those that are in power can change this direction, even in a multiple other ways than just putting the vote in the ballot. And I think this promise of democracy is something that the ministers of justice in our respective countries need to uphold and need to work for. The second thing that, I, that, is, that we are all facing now, and in particular though we as decision makers, is this flagrant breach of international law by the Russian Federation. Putin's aggression against Ukraine has changed the world as we know it. And the question that is at stake is not only the Ukraine's future, but the question that is at stake is our liberal democracy. It's our freedom, it's our international law. And our joint task now is to make sure that the rule of power will not be able to replace the rule of law. So far, the European answer has been strong and united in full solidarity with the people of Ukraine and also those forced to flee. The European position is clear. The atrocities committed in Ukraine must not go unpunished. My colleagues and I are working together to ensure accountability and to ensure the international rule of law. And this is also one aspect of being a minister of justice that is relevant to international relations. And with regard to individual responsibility, Austria, together with 39 other state parties, submitted the situation in Ukraine to the ICC. And as a founding member, Austria fully supports the International Criminal Court in the fight against impunity. I had the pleasure to meet the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, and we agreed that swift and systematic collection of evidence is key. And the good thing, and I think that we are learning a lot also from the past, the good thing now is that a lot of initiatives, there are a lot of initiatives that are at the forefront that are gathering evidence for future trials. And I think this is something that we missed in the past, and I think this is something that we can make right now. We have to gather evidence as swiftly as possible so that those crimes, those atrocities, those crimes against humanities can be prosecuted. And why is this prosecution of crimes, of atrocities, of war crimes so important? I think it's important also because of transitional justice. If you want that Transitional, if you want that the cooperation or that the reconciliation is working, we need individual responsibility. And this is why it will be necessary all, that all those who committed war crimes, who committed crimes against, will, crimes against humanity, will be brought to justice. And when I'm talking about transitional justice, I want to make a move to another region of our world, which is a very, it's, important to European Union, but also important to me personally, because it's a region where, I'm, where I originated from, and this is the Western Balkans. As you all know, 30 years ago, there was a war waging in the Western Balkans. And to tell you the truth, a lot of steps that have been taken by the international community led to the situation where we are in now. Transitional justice, has not, has, uh, there was no transitional justice until now. And the thing is that, and why do I consider it very important? I consider it important because this region is in the midst of the European Union. If we want to stabilize European Union, we have to make sure that this missing link is being brought back to the European Union, is being brought back to the region. Because as unstabilized as it is, it is an easy target for many other geopolitical influences. And this is why I, as Minister of Justice, with my other colleagues and also foreign ministers, we are working to persuade certain decision makers to not lose sight of the Western Balkans again, because that happened in the future, and we see that there are potential, that there is a potential for danger and for endangering this region. 
to tell you one story, this is, and this is something that I want to share with you just to show you how important diplomacy is and how important it is um, to not lose sight of a specific region. I was, uh, at the beginning of July, like, uh, July, I had the opportunity to visit Bosnia and Herzegovina because um, it's, uh, it's a, it was a, a, a decisive moment. Um, as you know, um, the Western Balkans and the countries of Western Balkans are aspiring to, uh, to, to join the European Union and somehow they are not, there, there's no move whatsoever. So I thought it would be good, as in particular as a minister of, uh, as a minister of the Republic of Austria, uh, to visit Bosnia and Herzegovina. And to also to, clay, to, to bring the message that, in particular, Austria will support the region in the integration in the, into the European Union. And to be honest with you, with the first days, at the first day I met with a lot of decision makers, with the Minister of Justice there, and with, uh, uh, with I, other high leaders, and somehow, it was frustrating. It was frustrating because there was a political deadlock. It was a political deadlock and a political paralysis. Nothing was going on and no little changes were possible and I was really frustrated. If it's going to be like that, then the chances to enter the European Union or to make the necessary changes to enter the European Union are diminishing. But the second day of my visit, I spent the day with the civil society. I spent the day with young leaders who want to change things. And this gave me hope because there are so many young, lead many young leaders, there's such an engaging civil society that is so vibrant and it wants, needs, des desperately needs our support. And this is a message, that, and this is a highlight of my visit, and this is a message that I want to share with you. As aspiring diplomatic experts, I would like to encourage you to always engage with the local civil society, with the local players in your work. International relation is more than cooperation between states or their executives. For effective international cooperation, it is necessary to bring the local population to the forefront in order for them to reach a stage where can, they can be effective and where can, they can actually change certain things. And why this is important, and I'm coming back to a point, to one point that I made at the beginning. Engaging with local communities, with the civil society, with people, can bring the trust back into democracy. Young people are losing the trust into democracy, and this is dangerous. If you look at the figures, almost 60% of the youth in Germany do not believe in democracy. And we need to bring that trust back to these people, and that's why engaging with them is so crucial and so important. And this is all what, and in essence, this is what graduate school is all about. It's a place of community. It's a place of dialogue, of interaction, of vivid and open discussion. And more than studying international textbooks, international theory, it's all about learning from and with each other. It's about supporting each other. It's about solidarity. It's about mutual trust and mutual respect. And this, all of this starts here. Therefore, listening or learn to listen, listen carefully, attentively to others. Listening is such an important skill, especially nowadays. And it's the basis for mutual appreciation, for proper interaction in a pluralistic and a diverse world, for a cosmopolitan way of future thinking, for a spirit of optimism. Dear student, I wish you a successful academic year, full of exciting new experiences and full of positive vision of our future. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.
Dear uh, Minister Sadic, let me thank you for your inspiring speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me also thank uh, Director Briggs for his inspiring speech. It was a pleasure to listen to you for the second time uh, in my career here at the Diplomatic Academy. Um, and let me thank you, our distinguished guests, uh, dear excellencies, and of course, the academic chairs um, and the language department. Dear students, the study at the Diplomatic Academy is a journey. You will face new obstacles and also have new opportunities. You come from diverse back backgrounds, but in my experience, students of this institution have one thing in common, and that is the will and the determination to make an impact in the world, wherever you may go after you finish your studies here. We, as the Diplomatic Academy Student Initiative, and at this point let me thank my dear colleagues, Matthew Myers, Lillian Lundström, and Maria Blomenhofer, who sadly couldn't be with us today, um, for their involvement as well. Um, we will do our best to support you throughout the year and be there for you in, with any questions or helping you with sorting out your studies and your, your uh, events. Uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you here at the Diplomatic Academy for all the first years and to welcome our dear second years back this year. We want to encourage all of you to get involved at the Academy. I know that especially with the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, socializing has become um, a bit difficult for some of us, but um, it is really the, the biggest value of this institution really comes from working together and spending time with each other and engaging together with academic issues as well as social issues. From my side, warm welcome and welcome back to this academic year. And please approach us with any questions you might have. Thank you.
Please take a seat. I'm just here to say words of thank you. First of all, to Larissa Punakova. Thank you for the give a round of applause to our peers. I'm not sure whether I was supposed to say that, but she is one of the Russians now living here in Austria. Uh, and a word of thank you to the minister who just left us. That's a typical task and type of ministers. They're always leaving somewhere or coming somewhere. But I think her speech was inspiring. I guess I, guess I felt like that. Uh, and I would simply like to say, because this is an official ceremony, let the games begin. <laughs> we have a reception prepared for you. So thank you for attending the ceremony. <laughs>